Now, the question here is, what went wrong? How did we fall away from knowing this ancient and sacred knowledge of how to center ourselves? How to be sovereign? How to be the Superman? How do we lose our own awareness of our own divinity? So, I believe that the sovereignty of the self can only be reattained by transcending fear. And all of our fears have come from our fear of nature or our antipathy to nature, which is why when we go back into nature and stay for a little while, once the fear has subsided, we feel invigorated, we feel rejuvenated. This is why hiking and surfing and rock climbing are so empowering for the person. They're, they're, they create a balance. They bring you back into center. So what went wrong? Quoting Benjamin Stewart from the documentary Kaimatica, which I highly recommend seeing. It's a pretty incredible esoteric documentary. An explanation of our conscious universe has been attempted by religion, science, and philosophy. The neglect of biological nature from any organism causes illness. I'll repeat that. The neglect of biological nature from any organism causes illness. That is our own biological natural nature, our connection to earth. A divorce from nature, an exile from Eden, the confounding of tongues. These are all symptoms, not of a big biblical God or deity, but of the true self. The greatest and only threat to ourselves is a loss of self, which is the death of our own divinity. We, as we barrel through history with oceans of information, yet barely a drop of wisdom, we have to understand how we lost ourself. Benjamin Stewart. So he, he's saying our antipathy to nature is our cause for all of our psychological fragmentation, which is why we have practices of, we could go on forever, of destroying the planet, ruining the water tables, slaughtering animals, injecting them with hormones, feeding them to people, creating destruction throughout nature using atomic energy or explosion-based technology, constantly destroying fossil fuels over and over and over and over and over and over again. The reason why we do this is because we are not discerning. We are not seeing nature as it is, which is a self-sustaining, sovereign process of energetic unfoldment. And we should do what I, what I like to say, what I call biomimicry, which means to mimic nature. Because nature, as I understand it, is our greatest teacher. So I'll quote from Michael Tessarian again on the antipathy to nature. Antipathy to nature is in, actually, antipathy to the self, is an, Antipathy to nature is an actuality. In is in actuality antipathy to the self. Because nature is living mind from the Hermetica. And we are it and we are in it. The body is nature. But we did not create the body. Nature did. So the origin of all man's neuroses and pathology is man's antipathy to nature. The consciousness of man, the quote-unquote fall from grace, is man's disconnection from nature. This causes neurosis and psychological issues which eventually become apparent in society and in each individual person's human body, the temple. So quoting Eric Fromm, this is what we call sadism or self hate. And just understand that this is a strong word, but there is an incredible amount of sadism in our society, which is why the great philosophers have constantly criticized society in the European tradition, because the self-hate is unconscious. There's only, there's only a few people who are doing this work, who are digging, who are looking into themselves, 
sanitizing themselves, cleaning themselves, to ask these poignant questions. Are they the ones who are realizing the level of sadism that we have amongst our current culture? So, Eric Fromm, the aim of sadism is to transform a man into a thing, something animate into something inanimate. Since by complete and absolute control, the living, the living loses one essential quality of life, freedom. Again, freedom and sovereignty is lost. Taking, transforming a man into a thing, taking his spirit out of him and making him a material object, a monetized object, a worker bee, a part of the collective, the societal group the collective, is the antithesis of freedom, antithesis of sovereignty, the antithesis of individuality, and is self-sadism. The great work of Wilhelm Reich, if you've never read Wilhelm Reich, I highly suggest reading it. Incredible, incredible uh, author. Only the liberation of the natural capacity again, it refers to nature, for love in human beings can master their sadistic destructiveness. Again, sadistic, sadist, the sedictive, sadistic destructiveness on an unconscious level can only be liberated of a natural capacity for love in human beings. This is, again, it's moving out of the intellectual left brain and into the heart space where love can occur a great connection between not only man to man or human to human, but the connection through all of nature to create that harmony. R.A. Schwaller de Lubix in the book, Nature Word, uh, probably the greatest thinker in the Western world in the last, well, I'll say in the last 300 years, I mean, obviously, this is just my opinion, but if you've never read R. H. Waller de Lubix, uh, it, it'll change your life. I highly recommend reading him. The fundamental error we have made is to have accepted a mentality which is in contradiction to the thinking of nature. We granulate into time and space what could be a grasping of a whole. We use spatial language to speak of non-spatial concepts. So here he's just pointing out how, how powerful language is in upholding one's reality. We use spatial language to speak of non-spatial concepts, which is, which is constantly creating fragmentation in the psyche because it is not accurate. It's literally like not able to see what is actually happening in front of you because your language is dictating how you see. Our psychological consciousness projects its picture of things as a fragmented play of opposites back onto the external world and then takes this picture to be real. So again, this is just further fragmentation. This is how man's mental constructs or theories about the world are how he dictates how he sees the world. And they are not always correct. And so here, I'd like to say that in the book uh, by David Baum, who was a protege who worked underneath Einstein, spoke out in his, against his own academic peership, one of the only physicists who poignantly and provably shattered the current physics paradigms of Einstein and Newton. Um, highly recommend reading David Baum. His book is called, well, he's got a few books, but his book is called Wholeness in the Implicate Order. And he's basically saying the same thing, that we are not connecting the dots. There's a huge cognitive dissonance there. And so Carl Jung talks about this when he talks about the nature of consciousness and reality as being specular. So Jung says, we know that the mask of the unconscious is not rigid. It reflects the face we turn toward it. Hostility lends it a threatening aspect. Friendliness softens its features. This is basically saying that 
the way in which you approach reality, the universe will uphold to you as if it's a mirror or if it's speculative. So if your consciousness is fragmented, fearful, um, trep trepidation, um, anxious, seeking, then the universe is, is specular. It will reflect those qualities back to you. And that's the way you will think reality is. You will perceive reality in that way. How is this possible? The only way this is possible is because your center is your source of reality. So if your center is fragmented, then your reality is going to be fragmented. So, friendliness softens its features. If you approach reality with love, wholeness, discernment, joy, and so on, the world becomes a beautiful place. It's like rose-colored glasses. We get into another word that's thrown around a lot, definition of science. Now, I'm actually going to do the definition of conscience or conscience because this is where the word science actually resonates most for me. Conscience or with science. Con means with science. An inner feeling or voice acting as a guide to the rightness or wrongness of one's behavior. Hmm. Con science with science. Rightness or wrongness refers to a moral act or discernment. So science is actually born of philosophy, a way of thinking and acting in and with reality. So most people think that science, being theorems and numbers and so-called facts, is true or truth. But when you really understand and look at what science is or conscience, having conscience, is an inner feeling. It's not a fact. It's a feeling or a voice even. It's our internal dialogue acting as a guide to the rightness or wrongness of one's behavior. There's huge implications in there that science is a type of wisdom. It is an approach to reality. It's not necessarily right or wrong. It's not necessarily true. So the scientist owes the entire scientific method and the entire uh, study of science to its origins in the human mind as a philosophy. This is why philosophers are constantly outshining scientists. Philosophers have been scientists before science was science. Okay, moving on. Oh, so this is just... Uh, a way to to edify that statement. This is Sir Isaac Newton's magnum opus, his greatest um, work of mathematical and physics principles, the one that we get all of his theories from. And notice what he titled his magnum, magnus, magnum opus. It's called The Philosophy of Natural Principles in Mathematics. So he he knew himself that numbers and math and the way in which we manipulate them is not necessarily the way in which nature has created reality. It is just our philosophical view or our approach to reality. And this is a key thing for intellectuals to get, is that, that even the principles of math are still a philosophy to a large degree. Another, so back to the self, another amazing philosopher we all know, Plato. The first and noblest of all victories is for man to conquer himself. Why would Plato say this? Because if you're seeking knowledge, it is not a process of grasping facts. It's not a process of, uh, it is a process of seeing and, and discerning, but the process of reality takes place within within our own consciousness, behind our own eyes, in our own center. And Plato knew this. So the first and noblest of all victories is for man to conquer himself, which just means to know himself, to know when he is actually letting his emotions or his past beliefs cloud his view of what's happening now, right now, 
in the present. This is where belief systems come into play. Consciousness creates the form. Form is the sacred. Science, nature reveals inside and outside divine, the divine man. So consciousness creates the form, not the other way around. You don't learn about consciousness from studying something physical. You learn about consciousness from studying something non-physical. The form is created by consciousness, which is a science. Nature reveals our greatest teacher inside and outside the divine man. The etymology of science refers to scission. S-C-I-S -S is where we get the word scissors, scission, or to split meaning to cut or split. Science is a paradox, which means a problem. It's a philosophical problem that can only be resolved in repairing. Another interesting word, repair, means to pair again, to take something that has been split and unify it or bring together, to repair. Again, the inner with the outer reality. Key point here, all true science is the sacred awareness in nature as wholeness. Let me say that again. All true science is the sacred awareness in nature as wholeness. So when science is trying to pick apart nature and compartmentalize it, it is fragmenting nature. It is splitting nature. It is not repairing nature. It is destroying nature. And this is why our approach to reality is so neurotic because we are literally fighting our own nature. We're fighting the nature we see, our antipathy, our neurosis. Hmm. So another way in which to look at this fragmentation of the mind is by reading uh, the works of Terence McKenna. Terence McKenna saying, talking about the holographic universe, the unformed archetypes of the collective unconscious may be the holographic substrate of the species mind. That just means the archetypes that exist in our consciousness may be a hologram of our entire collective each individual mind or brain is then like a fragment of the total hologram, but in accordance with holographic principles. Each fragment contains the whole. It will be remembered, remembered, that each part of the hologram can reconstruct an entire image, but that the details of the image will be deteriorated in proportion to its fragmentation, while the overall structure will remain. Out of this feature, the hologram may arise, is the quality of the individual point of view in the fact, individually, individuality itself, and in fact, individuality itself. Each mind is a holographic medium, then each is contig contiguous with every other. Because the ubiquitous distribution of information in a hologram, each individual mind would thus be a representation of the essence of reality but the details cannot be resolved until the fragments of the collective hologram were joined. All of that is basically saying to repair, to join, to join the fragments of the hologram in order to see nature as it is, which is a whole, an infinite whole. The fragments he's talking about that exist in the collective consciousness are reflections of the fragments that exist in the self individual self. So the only way to change the world is to change yourself. Schwaller de Lubix goes on to say, initiation into this process of selfhood is self-induced, naturally. Consciousness is itself sovereign, self-defining. Consciousness is self-defining. It is the super reign. It is it's the superman. Measure is the precise definition of cause to its end. Measure is the precise definition of cause to its end. Each thing by this fact has in itself its own measure. 
but this measure becomes all the more complete as the thing effectively summarizes the cosmic ego. Basically saying, we define our own self. We are, in fact, divinely empowered, infinitely empowered. We are only limited by our limitations that we define, that we create for ourselves. Consciousness is none other than measure of itself in itself. So if you are creative enough to measure yourself as infinite, then you are. This seems very abstract as long as we don't allow the term of comparison to intervene. This is the case for the mineral and again for the plant. But as soon as we enter the higher animal kingdom, we see duality formed in which the being becomes more and more animated and is so or appears so because it is capable of measuring itself. In other words, it becomes conscious of itself, takes cognizance of its I of its ego. Same thing. We are it. Schwaller de Lubitz continues in the, in the book Nature Word. It is consciousness that evolved, not form. Thus I can say everything has its own measure or consciousness. Better still, everything is only consciousness in itself. Or all form is only the determination or appearance of a state of consciousness. You will, I think, understand me. A will and will eliminate for yourselves this antique and false notion of intellectual consciousness stuck in the left brain, but which has nothing to do with cosmic consciousness or the whole. It is consciousness which evolves, not form. Changes in form result from evolution in consciousness on both the individual and cosmic levels. What he's saying is that that when we think that matter is evolving, when we watch, you know, a, frog, a tadpole become a frog, or a, a caterpillar become a butterfly, we, we look at the form and say the form is evolving. But that's an incorrect look at what's happening. If we look at it as a whole, or with cosmic consciousness, we see that it's the consciousness that is causing the form to change. So it's consciousness that is evolving, not the form. The form is just a reflection or a representation of, of this. And God said, let there be light. Genesis 1-3. Genesis, the gene of Isis, referring to the female goddess in ancient Egypt. Gene, where we get the word generate the generation of Isis. And God said, let there be light. Now just whom was he speaking to? Interesting. He's referring to, hopefully you can follow me with this, he's referring to the sacred, the sacred womb of Isis, the female. The splitting of pi is the very first thing, the maneuver that you learn in sacred geometry is is taking a circle and adding another circle to it that's equal, in an equal way, in an equal ratio. And what you have when you do this is a split, or the first move into duality. The splitting of pi is literally where we get the word Pisces. It doesn't refer to fish. It refers to a split. It's the splitting of the pi, the circle. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the spirit or spiral of God moved upon the face of the waters, which is her, the female. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. This is a, a classic esoteric teaching of how scriptures, in this case the Bible, are not meant to be taken literally, but are referring to a deeper meaning it deals with cosmic, natural principles, or principles in nature. This principle being rudimentary and sacred to nature, which is the splitting of pi, which is a, a representation of the female womb. And we see this in very ancient art and religious architecture. This being ancient goddess Isis, 
with the flower of life being drawn equally around her, her womb. This is an ancient uh, stone carving of a womb as well, the Vesica Pisces. And this is just classic art in Islam, the tarot, and Christianity of their sacred god being born of the womb, which is the female vagina, which refers to the Vesica Pisces.